right, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. We are going to get started. Today's presentation is on tax saving strategies for real estate investors. Your presenters today are David Pirpura, who's going to be discussing the IRA side of our business, and Mike Reinhardt, who will be discussing the 1031 side of our business. If you guys have any questions, please save them until the end of the presentation. You can type them in the chat box, which should be at the bottom of your screen, um, and we will answer them afterwards. So I'm going to let David take it away. And thank you all for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Papora. I am the Special Plans Associate here at Midland IRA. A little bit about Midland IRA. We are self-directed IRA administrators, and we also do 1031 exchanges. As Brenda mentioned, I'm going to be going over the self-directed IRA administration side, while my colleague Mike Reinhardt will be going over the 1031s. A little bit about Midland, uh, we have two offices, one in Chicago and one in Fort Myers in Florida. We have over a billion dollars in client assets and the full limits of federal deposit insurance corporation protection. And we have over 10,000 account holders. We make notice, no commissions, we don't sell investments, and we work at your direction to fully admin it administrate the needs and requirements of investments that you choose. We do not give any legal, tax, or investment advice, but our offices are operated by individuals with backgrounds in the legal and tax fields. Many of our staff men members have also achieved the designation of Certified IRA Service Professional. So the main benefit of um, Midland and the self-directed IRAs that we do offer is that it's truly up to the account holder where they will have full full control of their plans. Midland IRA, we don't advise, we don't um, solicit any investments. It's truly up to the account holder um, that they will be choosing their investments. All information and material uh, that we provide is for educational purposes, but we always advise our clients and account holders to uh, seek outside consult uh, consultation from their attorneys, accountants, or financial advisors. So onto the question of what is a self-directed IRA? It's not any sort of special type of IRA. Some are tax deferred, uh, such as a traditional IRA, and some are tax free, uh, depending on meeting the qualifications for that in a Roth IRA. Uh, Self-directed IRA allows the IRA holder to choose any investment they want and feel comfortable in, um, rather than your traditional brokerage house IRA, where you're limited to mostly stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. With a self-directed IRA, it gives you unlimited choices, um, so you can really invest in something that you know. The only two things that you aren't allowed to invest in is collectibles and life insurance. So your IRA can't buy that 1964 Mercedes-Benz and call it an asset. But it can um, invest in just about anything else. 99% of IRA custodians, as I said, will only hold stocks, bonds, and mutuals. Um, and most contributions are tax deductible for self-directed IRAs, depending on uh, your plan. Once again, we always advise that you take it up with a CPA or tax attorney to be sure of the tax implications since we don't solicit any tax advice. Um, most of our IRAs are funded by old 401ks and they're designed to build wealth for your retirement. Uh, I touched a little bit on the different types of accounts that we offer, but primarily we offer traditional, which are tax deferred. Uh, the money going in is pre-tax and when it comes out and distributed at retirement age, it will then be taxed. Um, you also have Roth IRAs that we offer, which are already have already paid taxes when you contribute the money, and then when you pull out, if you meet the if you satisfy the uh, requirements for it, then you can uh, have no taxes during the distribution. We also offer SEP and simple IRAs, which are for small business owners and can open up more of the contribution side, where you're able to. Uh, contribute sometimes up to twenty five thousand dollars if you're going uh, if you meet all the requirements for it. But we also offer a couple different products like solo four hundred one k's, which not many people know about. But it's a self directed four hundred one k, and this is really a great 
tool for anyone who's trying to build up a retirement account. Um, and they don't have much in it because the 401k contributions are much higher than the traditional and Roth. But what you need to do to satisfy uh, those requirements to be able to open up a solo 401k is you must be self-employed and have no full-time employees. But you can have contributions annually on the employee and employer side, a total contribution of up to $55,000. We also offer health savings accounts and education savings accounts, which are also specialty accounts by us. And with those, you'll be able to also invest in these alternative investments. Uh, as I said, um, you know, most brokerage houses limit you to stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, but a self-directed IRA, your investment choices really expand and open up to things such as real estate, secure promissory notes, single member LLCs, private placements such as hedge funds and private stock, precious metals such as gold, silver, platinum and palladium, and also foreign currency exchanges and futures trading, and it's virtually limitless your IRA choices. But today we're gonna to talk about real estate IRAs and the benefits of those. Um, real estate has become one of the most popular investments uh, with our self-directed IRAs. And there's uh, a lot of money in retirement accounts. The value of IRAs in the United States is over $6.8 trillion with only 2% of those, of those IRA funds invested in real estate. So most professionals are not taking advantage of this untapped market. I know a lot of people who are listening into this are real estate professionals themselves. And as we said on a previous slide, a self-directed IRA opens up the investment possibilities for things that you know and things that you're comfortable with. And if you're comfortable with real estate, it opens up the possibility to invest in that and for you to control. Um, the benefit of using Midland for these uh, deals is that we have fast turnaround times with documents for closing being done in a matter of only two business days. Uh, a majority of IRA real estate deals are done um, with cash. Um, not so, not with mortgages or anything because IRAs aren't allowed an extension of credit. Uh, however, if you or your clients need extra funds to purchase their investment property, there are ways to open that up, which we'll get into in later slides. Uh, the benefit of holding this real estate in your IRA is the growth in value in the property. And when you sell it, it's tax-free growth. And that's the benefit of these retirement accounts is that everything is tax-free growth. There's no capital gains tax. Um, rental incomes and sales proceeds, as I said. And Roth IRAs, as long as they meet certain qualifications, might never be taxed. This is really a great opportunity to grow your retirement funds. Uh, in addition, all real estate uh, qualifies, whether it's a single family home, apartment building, commercial property, uh, trust deeds, or vacant lands. Some important rules that we need to discuss is that the IRA is more or less a separate entity from the IRA account holder. So with that being said, the title to the asset is in the name of the IRA custodian or administrator. In the example of using Midland, it would be the title of the property, the buyer would be Midland Trust Company, FBO, the client name and client account number. And the percentage of ownership would be 100% by the IRA or just a percentage. We'll get into that one on the later slide when we start talking about partnerships. Um, another a crucial rule is that these are only allowed for investment properties. Personal, there can't be any personal use of the assets within the IRA because IRAs are not able to give personal benefit um, before uh, you take it as a distribution in retirement. So income and expenses um, for the property, such as rental income, and if you're doing a flip project, expenses such as building uh, material, all of those expenses have to be paid by the IRA. And you're not allowed to uh, do business. Uh, the IRA holder and IRA can't do any business with prohibited parties, which we'll get into now. 
a prohibited party is uh, yourself, your spouse, and any linear ascendants or descendants. And what I mean by that is that the IRA cannot do business with any of these. So for example, if I was an IRA holder and I had a property in my IRA, my tenant couldn't be my son. Um, it would have to be because it would, then it would be considered a prohibited transaction. And the same goes to if it's your mother or father or your grandparents or spouse. And this expands all the way to, you know, my son and my daughter-in-law as well. So like I said, there's a couple different ways that you can purchase uh, real estate in your IRA. The most popular one being a full cash purchase where the IRA uses 100% uses the funds to purchase the property. But there's also other ways if you don't have the money. And in this instance, the IRA can partner up with a friend, an associate, a family member, and even yourself. As long as it's a clear partnership where there's distinct percentages of ownership, then uh, it would be a suitable and um, an allowable investment. You could also partner up in ways of multi-member LLCs or joint ventures. As I said before, the IRA can't have an extension of credit. It can't have a mortgage. However, an IRA can borrow money um, in the form of a non-recourse loan. And what I mean when I say non-recourse is that the only collateral on the property is the property itself. Uh, and the only recourse the lender can take is a foreclosure on the property in the case of a default. Rather than on a typical mortgage you have personally, the, then I would be able, I would be personally uh, liable if I defaulted on the loan. These loans typically require a larger down payment, sometimes 40 to 60%, and the average rate is about a point above um, the average mortgage rates. Uh, as long as there's no personal guarantee from the IRA owner, it can be from a bank or private lender. Another way to purchase uh, real estate in your IRA is by using what's called a checkbook control LLC, which a lot of our clients use uh, as a tool. Benefits of a checkbook control LLC is that the IRA holder um, has full control over the investment rather than having to go through the administrator every time they want to purchase a property. Uh, the IRA itself would be the member of the LLC, and that's where the funds would be coming from. So how it's set up is the uh, in the operating agreement, the IRA is the member and funds the uh, LLC, and then the IRA holder then has the ability to execute any investment that they want without first consulting the administrator, thus giving it complete control and ability to write checks rather than in a typical real estate purchase out of an IRA. You would first have to consult the administrator, the administrator being Midland IRA in this instance, where we would have to, we would be doing the signing and executing of documents. Uh, some advantages of checkbook IRAs is you're able to pool funds if it's a multi-member IRA. Like I said, it gives more control to the IRA holder. Uh, there's no more going through the administrator for executing any purchases of property. So you'll have the ability to act quickly, which I know in a very volatile real estate market like we have is critical so that no sellers back out before you purchase the property. And it cuts down on check fees and asset fees on our side. So you'd be saving a lot of money and being able to expand your portfolio. How the checkbook IRA works, it, the checkbook uh, control LLC works is the IRA, it is an asset of the IRA and therefore an extension of the IRA. Now, the benefit of doing this with Midland is that Midland tries our best to make it as turnkey as possible. We try our best to make this a one stop shop for our clients so that there is complete ease for them. So, with that said, we have a sister company called IRA Doc Prep. If you look at the uh, if you look at the web address on the slide currently, that is the link to the homepage of it. And all you need to do is hit 
is click get started. Um, from there, you'd be able to, after you filled out your application and your account was approved, you would then be able to have your, your checkbook control LLC set up in the same shop, uh, in the same instance by giving the possible LLC names that you would like and the state in which you would like it registered. And, and to reiterate, this gives full control of your assets and the ease of doing it without first consulting your IRA administrator. Uh, just a little bit about LLCs for any of our clients listening in um, who aren't familiar with them. Uh, an LLC is an entity established under state laws that limits the liability of its members and provides a conduit for managing a project, property, or investment. In our instance, it would be managing investments. Generally speaking, IRA holder and his or her lineal descendants cannot be the manager of multi of uh, the corporation. This is because the IRS does not want you to personally have access to your IRA funds. However, as I said before, there are exceptions for this, and that is the checkbook control LLC, where it's a single member LLC and the only member being the IRA. Um, the client or non-disqualified third party can be the manager of this LLC, but the most critical part of it is that the manager can't receive any compensation from the LLC. So the manager can't receive a salary from it. Uh, the bank account is established under the LLC and the manager, most of the time is the IRA holder, uh, has full check rating ability and thus giving you the ease of transactions. However, with the ease of transactions comes a lot more responsibility. It, uh, the IRA holder needs to be aware of prohibited parties and prohibited transactions, which your client service representative at Midland will be help, able to help you the whole way through. Just want to reiterate before we get to our next section, if you have any questions, type them into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We'll answer all your questions at the end of the presentation. The last way uh, that you'll be able to invest in real estate using your self-directed IRA is with promissory notes. Uh, promissory notes are loans to uh, uh, either an LLC or a personal note with your IRA being the bank. Uh, it gives you the ability to participate in an investment without committing long term. Most of our clients have promissory notes with uh, terms such as six months to three years. And this also avoids UBIT issues if investing in leveraged entities. Now, a lot of you are probably asking, what is UBIT? UBIT is undisclosed business income tax, which could possibly be uh, a factor in uh, purchasing properties uh, under uh, multi-member LLCs. But once again, we always ask that you uh, consult your CPA or tax attorney before um, making any investments so that you are clear if you are uh, going to be um, involved in any possible UBIT tax. So getting back to the promissory notes, all the interest income is tax deferred or tax free. So the payments that you get from these promissory notes would be going into the IRA directly and therefore the capital gains uh, and growth in your IRA would be tax free. And typically these notes have higher interest rates than prime rate. We usually see them around six to 12%. Um, a couple of rules about promissory notes is the IRA investment are required to be held by the third party administrator, just like the property would have to be held by the IRA administrator with the titling Midland Trust Company as custodian, FBO the client name and client account number. In this instance with promissory notes where your IRA is becoming the bank for someone or an entity, the lender is the IRA instead of the client directly. So it would have that similar titling of Midland Trust Company, FBO, uh, client name and client account number. The IRA administrator is legally the holder of the note in this instance. So how we usually do that with all of our clients is that for, uh, unsecured promissory notes and secure promissory notes where real estate is collateral, 
they send us the note directly and we hold on to the note because the IRA is the holder of the note rather than the account holder. All documents uh, must be read and approved by our clients. Um, we do this by having the client initial all of the documents, thus saying that they've read and approved. And then we sign the IRA administrator because like I said, the IRA is the one doing the lending. All interest income and principal payments will be sent to Midland IRA. Uh, typically with secured um, promissory note transactions where a piece of real estate is used as a collateral in it, they typically have lo uh, low, low loan to value ratios around 60 to 70 percent and are usually a first or second position mortgage. As I said before, they're typically short term notes where there's a where there's a higher interest rate. The term is usually between six months to seven years and the higher interest rates are about the same as the uh, promissory notes we discussed before. But the benefit of this is that the borrower is gonna be paying all the costs, the appraisal on the property, the attorney fees, and the document stands. The documents that um, we require in order to fund a secure promissory note is a bi-direction letter, which gives us permission to send the funds out from your IRA. We need a copy of the promissory note where it clearly lists the amount that's gonna be uh, lent to the borrower as well as the maturity date on it and the interest rate and payments that are going to be made to the IRA which the IRA holder in a self-directed IRA determines all of the terms of this note. Um, we require a mortgage that would be recorded with the county in which the property that um, was used as collateral. The settlement statement will need hazard insurance so that your investment is safe title insurance, and the wire instructions in order to send the money out. I just want to give a couple quick examples and reiterate some of the things that we talked about earlier on in the webinar. Uh, the first one is about Bob. Bob has a cash deal and he opens a Midland self-directed IRA. Bob transfers $200,000 from another IRA that he held at a previous custodian, and Bob makes an offer for a $175,000 purchase um, to a property. What Bob does next after he's made his offer and his offer is accepted, he'll send his contract uh, over to his Midland Client Service Associate, which all of our uh, clients get a dedicated representative in order to assist them with all investments. He'll send his contract over to his dedicated rep who will then upload it to DocuSign to have Bob approve and initial all his documents to make sure that he's read and approved them and he's okay with sending the money out. As the administrator, we take a very third party stand back um, approach to it where we're not giving any advice, we're not telling uh, them this is a good deal or anything like that. That is purely left up to the IRA holder to determine that. Once Bob approves and initials all of his closing documents, um, Midland will go ahead and sign because we're the administrator of the IRA and the IRA is the one purchasing it and that separation between personal and IRA needs to be established. We do the signing of the closing documents and send uh, the funds to the closing company. And Bob now has a new real estate property as asset in his IRA. Next, uh, I wanted to give an example. I talked a little bit about partnering before, and now Bob has found another property. Fantastic. The total purchase price is $200,000, but after his last purchase, Bob only has $50,000 left in his IRA. He needs another $150,000. So the way Bob can get that $150,000 is he can partner up with himself where they, uh, Bob's IRA would own 25% of the property, and then uh, Bob personally would own 75% uh, of the property. Bob can partner up with his friend Emily's IRA, where Emily's IRA pitches in the other $150,000, then she owns 75%, and his IRA owns 25%. Or Bob and Emily um, both personally go on it, and then, uh, Bob 
uh, personally funds $50,000, Emily funds $100,000, and Bob's IRA funds $50,000. The key part of this is that the percentages have to be clear on the contract, settlement statement, deed of um, what uh, ownership is. Because when it comes down to it, as we said before, expenses need to be paid out of the IRA and those percentages have to stay proportional throughout the investment. So if they got a bill um, from a builder for $10,000 and it was split 25% four ways, each IRA or personally, they would have to send in 25% uh, of that $10,000 bill. Another example is about commercial property. As uh, I said before, all real estate property is possible to ha use as an investment in your IRA. So in this example, John and his associate Jay want to purchase an office condo for $250,000 within their SEP IRAs. So they open an account at Midland uh, IRA. They open <coughs> two SEP IRAs two self-directed SEP IRAs at Midland IRA, and they transfer $150,000 from their SEPs uh, at their brokerage account to the self-directed SEPs in order to purchase the property, and they partner up with each other. <clears throat> How to start um, getting on this invest these investments, and with 20 the end of 2017 approaching, it's critical to begin now. Uh, the first step would be to open a self-directed IRA by filling out our application. Uh, next would be to fund your self-directed IRA, which you could do by contributions. Uh, if you're under the age of 50, then you uh, then you would be able to contribute $5,500 um, $5, to your self-directed IRA. And if you're over that age, you'd have another $1,000 uh, catch-up. So a total of $6,500. If you have a previous IRA that you have at a brokerage house or uh, at another custodian, you can transfer over the IRA, which is a non-taxable or non-reportable event. Or if you have an old 401k from a previous company you used to work for, or you can roll it over into either a traditional Roth, SEP, or simple IRA. And then next, you choose your investment, and our dedicated reps help you through that entire process. Thank you for letting me present. I'm now uh, going to hand this over to my colleague, Mike Reinhardt, who is going to be talking about 1031 exchanges. My name is Mike Reinhardt. Uh, I'm a 1031 exchange specialist over here at Midland IRA. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit um, about what 1031 exchanges are. Um, so the first thing is what kind of taxes will a 1031 exchange defer? Uh, and the short and sweet answer of it is all taxes associated with the sale of a piece of real property. Um, so that includes capital gains, any depreciation recapture tax, state taxes. Uh, and the reason it says usually is because Pennsylvania is the one state that doesn't recognize tax code section 1031 at the state level. So if you're selling a piece of property in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, they will still expect to collect their state taxes. But this is the only state that doesn't recognize it. Um, you'll also be able to defer the 3.8% healthcare tax that was put into place in 2013. So aside from deferring taxes, why should someone consider an exchange? Um, so there's a few different reasons, uh, and we'll, we'll discuss these in the upcoming slides here. Um, so you can acquire property with greater income potential. So if you either own a piece of vacant land, or let's say you inherited a piece of vacant land and are not sure what to do with it, as long as it's investment property, which generally vacant land is because you're not using it too much personally, you can sell and roll over those the sale proceeds into different type of investments, whether it be residential property, multifamily, commercial buildings, anything like that. Um, you are allowed to exchange from vacant land to those types of properties. You can consolidate. So if you have a few properties, in this example it's two, but it can really be any number then you would like to consolidate that into one larger property so it's a little bit easier to manage. Uh, you can do that as well. You can combine the proceeds into one single purchase um, or you know you can combine six sales into three purchases. Uh, any, 
any number that you want to throw in there really works as long as we follow the rules. So you can acquire less management intensive property. Um, so this kind of relates to the previous slide, but you know, say you're looking for something that you're just hoping appreciates in capital value rather than produces income. You can go from commercial or residential properties and purchase vacant land that for whatever reason you believe is going to appreciate at some point in time down the line. Another thing you can do that's not very popular right now, is we're starting to see a lot more of it, is invest in what's called Delaware Statutory Trusts, or DSTs. They function very much like real estate investment trusts, but for the purposes of 1031 exchanges, um, ownership in a DST is considered to be ownership in real property, whereas if you own shares of a REIT, you own shares of an entity. So that's the key difference that allows them for 1031 exchanges. So you can move markets. Uh, there's no limit to crossing state lines. Um, so as you can see from the slide, you can sell property in North Carolina and buy it in Florida, sell in Florida um, and buy in Georgia or buy in Ohio and sell in Florida. Any, any state lines is fine. Um, the only thing you cannot do is exchange domestic property for foreign property or foreign property for domestic property. Those two classes are not considered like kind under the umbrella of the 1031 tax code session. So there's a few common misconceptions about exchanges. Um, one of them is that you must swap properties. Uh, this is how exchanges were originally designed to be used um, back before the Starker ruling that allowed you to defer uh, taxes and allowed you a little bit more time, uh, 180 days to complete the exchange. So you don't have to swap properties. You can sell now and buy later. Um, so it's only for investors of large commercial properties. This is again a uh, common misconception. Um, it is for any investor that has capital gains, depreciation recapture, or any other taxes associated with the sale that they'd like to defer. Um, so the next one would be property of similar use or service. This kind of boils down to the like kind requirement. A lot of people think that if I sell a residential piece of property that I need to buy a residential piece of property. Um, this is, this is a common misconception. You can, the like kind definition is extremely broad. So any piece of investment or business use property is like kind to any other piece of investment or business use property. Um, so you can go from a commercial building to vacant land, vacant land to residential, multifamily to commercial, really anything. As long as it's investment or business use, that's, that's the key concern. The last thing is that they're very complicated and not worth doing. Uh, we, we really try and make it as easy as possible, uh, and most of our previous clients would agree. Once, once you send us the information we need, we take care of everything from getting the documents set up, establishing the escrow account, communicating with title companies uh, to make sure everything is in order as far as the exchange is concerned. Um, and we kind of do all this behind the scenes. So once, once you employ us as your qualified intermediary, uh, we, we really do take care of everything. So there's five basic rules that we like everyone to know about 1031 exchanges. Um, there's listed in front of you and each subsequent slide we'll go over them in greater detail. Um, so we have the net selling rule, like kind investment real estate, qualified intermediary, 45 day rule, and 180 day rule. Um, so as we go through the next slides, I'll go into a little bit more detail on these items. So the first one is the net selling price. This is the question we get asked the most. Um, it is it's really important to the exchange. Um, it's basically answers the question of how much do you need to spend to pay no taxes on your exchange. Um, so how we calculate this number is the listed or gross selling price of the property less any closing costs. So this will include your realtor commissions, title fees, doc stamp fees, attorney's fees, things like that. The only thing that will not reduce the net sales price is the payoff of any debt or loan on the property or any costs related to the debt or loan. Um, so generally, if you sell for $200,000 on a clean fear clear and free property, excuse me, um, say your closing costs are $20,000, that gets you the net selling price of $180,000. So that's the number the IRS is gonna be concerned with uh, as far as taxes go. 
so here's a numerical example um, that assumes the closing the sales price is 220,000. Your closing costs are again 20,000. So your net sales price or the number you need to spend to have a completely tax deferred exchange is our net sales price of $200,000. So if you spend this $200,000 or more, you don't have to pay a dime in taxes. So the next is real property. Um, so both properties must be held for investment or business use. We touched on this a bit earlier. Um, and again, the, the like kind term doesn't apply to the character or nature or its quality or its grade. It, it's literally any investment or business use property is like kind to any other investment or business use property. Um, so they're very lenient in that matter. Um, and it, it does help investors out a lot as far as what they'd like to purchase. It opens up a lot of options. So next is the qualified intermediary. Uh, that is the role that we fill in the exchange. Uh, it's basically an independent third party that is required by the IRS to facilitate the exchange and only the exchange. So what this means is that throughout the process, uh, we make sure that all of the guidelines set forth by the IRS are followed and we, we handle the exchange, including holding the funds in escrow, funding the purchase, putting the documentation together, and all these things. Um, and it says that we facilitate the exchange and only the exchange. The reason being is because we have to be an independent third party, we cannot provide any investment advice, any opinions on tax matters, or anything like that. Um, so it's very common for us to encourage our clients to consult a tax professional if they have any specific numerical questions or if there's a gray area in the tax code as to whether they're allowed to do it or not and an opinion needs to be provided. We advise them to seek that opinion from a tax professional uh, because we are not legally allowed to provide an opinion on, the, on those matters. So the qualified intermediary may not be the taxpayer or yourself. You can't be your own qualified intermediary an agent of the taxpayer, so this includes anyone that works for you uh, or employed by you, a realtor, attorney, tax advisor, banker, accountant, employee, um, et cetera. It has to be a totally separate third party. So if you have an attorney that you work with um, for different, you know, different things on the side, that specific attorney could not be your qualified intermediary. You uh, employ a third party attorney or a third party tax advisor, anything like that, but they can't be one that you work with on a regular basis. Additionally, it can't be any lineal ascendant or descendant. Um, it can't be a prohibited party, similar to what Dave touched on. On the IRA side, um, that goes as well for who cannot be your qualified intermediary. It has to be a totally independent third party. So then we, we're gonna go over the time limits. Um, basically, the time clock for your exchange starts on the day you close on your sale. Um, so that would be the first day of the exchange, um, which extends 180 days. So they give you 180 days to then finish and close on all intended purchases. The first 45 days of that 180 is what's called the identification period. So by 11.59 p.m. on that 45th day, we would need the taxpayer to identify up to three potential replacement properties. Now this day is very important because it's a hard deadline. Um, there are no extensions outside of extensions provided for natural disasters. Um, so effectively, if you don't have any identifications by, you know, 11.59 p.m. on that 45th day, the exchange is over. Um, additionally, once you've identified them and that 45th day has passed, they cannot be changed or replaced. Um, so this is a very important deadline that can kind of determine the outcome of the remaining 135 days of the exchange. Other important information, um, we have what's called the same taxpayer requirement for these exchanges. So basically what that means is that the taxpayer that's on title to the relinquished property, the property that you sell, must take title to the property that you purchase. So if it's owned in a multi-member LLC with its own EIN, that LLC will need to take title to the replacement property in order for that taxpayer to have completed their exchange. Uh, the same thing would be true if you owned it individually. We'd like to see you take title to it individually on the replacement. Um, or if you own it, you know, you and your wife or you and your husband, if you own that property uh, jointly, we'd like to see the same title on the replacement. Um, another very important thing um, that unfortunately we run into a lot is that the exchange must be in place prior to the closing on the sale. 
Um, we have to have everything set up uh, in place, escrow account established, documents signed before you sign those closing documents. Once the property has been closed on for your sale, it's too late to set up the exchange. Um, we can get these set up last minute if need be. We generally prefer about a week to get it set up. Um, but if, if it's a last minute sale and you would like to do an exchange, we definitely can make it happen for you. So don't hesitate to give us a call. Uh, as long as you haven't closed yet, it's not too late to do it. So some other important information. Um, there is what's called a holding period requirement. Um, unfortunately, the IRS isn't very clear on this matter as there's not a defined holding period. So there's no exact amount of time that you have to hold it to satisfy this holding period. Generally, from the tax code, we see case law uh, and examples where a year and a day has been deemed sufficient. Um, we like to recommend two years uh, of holding the property for investment or business use to be safe. Um, and after that point, you're free to exchange the property again. Um, the reason that they have this section in here is because the 1031 exchange section is not intended for flip properties. So it's not intended for you to buy and flip properties over and over again. Um, it's essentially a buy and hold investment technique. <clears throat> um, so while you, know, you and I would agree that a fix and flip is an investment property, unfortunately, it is not uh, for the purposes of a 1031 exchange. Um, so that's basically all I have as far as the presentation goes. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer those now. Okay. All right. We do have a few questions, Mike. All right. All first right. one, what about a parking lot that is not being used? Can you 1031 exchange an unused parking lot? An unused parking lot? Um, yep. Yeah. Pretty much, uh, it's a piece of real property, um, regardless of whether it generates income. If you are charging people to park there, that's great. If not, you can consider it vacant land, um, but it's a piece of real property. So yes, it, it can be exchanged. Okay, how much does it cost to set up a 1031 exchange? So we charge flat fees. Um, it's based off the sales price of the relinquished property. So if you're selling your property for under $100,000, we would charge $795. If you're selling for over 100,000, we would charge 995. Um, and after that 995, that's, that's it. So if you're selling your property for a million dollars, it would still be 995. All right, wonderful. All right, switching gears back to the IRA side. Um, if anyone has any more 1031 questions or any more IRA questions, now's your time to type them. Um, but David, can I sell a rental property held by my IRA to purchase a condo that has limited off-season rental value and personally rent the property at fair market value during the off-season, resulting in an indirect contribution to my IRA? So if you were to sell your rental property held by your IRA to purchase a condo, um, my first question is, are you purchasing the condo in the IRA as well? If so, then you wouldn't be able to personally rent the property, even if it was at fair market value, because you can't have any personal use of the property, even if you are generating an income to it, because you'd basically be giving yourself an extra contribution is how the IRS sees it. Now, getting back to that question, if the property was held by the IRA and you sold it and then took a distribution of the funds, then you could personally buy the property and do with what you please. But in the aspect of the IRA, no, you would not be able to have any personal use. Okay. What if it is a single member LLC? Can you take title in your own name? Um, is that a 1031 question or an IRA question, Glenn? Ten thirty one. So it, it would really depend. Um, uh, generally, yes, because single member LLCs are passed through entities. Uh, you can't establish them with your own tax ID, but as long as you're reporting it on your own tax return, uh, single member LLCs and the individual are interchangeable. Um, so that's not an issue as far as the same taxpayer requirements concerned, because ultimately the same taxpayer is on title. Uh, so I have one question for you, David. Does personally mean he can use his own cash? Please explain personally. <clears throat> no problem. I know I went through that probably a little bit fast, but does personally mean he can use his own cash? 
yes, absolutely. And this is in a partnership situation where the IRA would, if the property is $100,000, the IRA would own 50% of the property by putting in $50,000. And then the IRA holder personally would put in $50,000 of his cash and own the property 50%. Now I use 50-50 for the example because it's easy math for me to do in my head, but that percentage can be anything. All right, so since I only own the property uh, personally and own half of it um, in my IRA, does that mean I can live in the property 50% of the time? The, I, the Since the IRA does own it as well, and we said before, that there can't be any personal use because it is an investment. No, you can't live in it personally until you take that distribution um, during your retirement years where you can then distribute the property to yourself personally and then you can live in it once you own it personally 100%. Okay, so even if I own only 1% in my IRA, I can't personally live in it? That's correct because it's an asset of the IRA. Okay, great. All right, next question. Can you roll simple IRA dollars into an existing self-directed IRA that was opened with a 401k rollover? So the question, the question is, no, no, I'm just reading it myself. So the question is, can you roll simple IRA dollars into an existing self-directed IRA that was opened with a 401k rollover? So that question we're worried about the uh simple now that it's in simple ira dollars yes you can transfer actually if you open a self-directed simple ira you can just transfer the funds over and it's a non-taxable event just going from simple ira to simple ira because it was originally rolled over from a 401k that's a previous move and that um doesn't matter in this situation but yes you can transfer funds from the simple IRA to a new self-directed simple IRA. Okay, thank you. Next question, where the IRA uh, borrows non-recourse, can the lender file notice of their loan? You said their only recourse is the value of the real estate. How would they collect if IRA defaulted? So the main aspect of a non-recourse loan is that the only recourse in the case of a default is the property itself. This is because IRAs are not allowed extensions of credit. So there has to be a separation because they wouldn't be able to collect on the IRA assets. So that is the catch 22 kind of, of a non-recourse loan is they wouldn't collect any more besides uh, foreclosing on the property. So that's why Banks typically require a more uh, a higher down payment, like 40 to 60 percent, rather than on your traditional mortgage, where you only have to put down 10 percent or even less on some. So in that case, their only uh, their only recourse is the property itself, and after that, they kind of call it a loss. Okay, what is the banking process for check control LLCs? Do you maintain a checkbook from a certain bank through Midland? So, like I said, a truly self-directed IRA is where the IRA holder makes all the decisions. So, the banking process for a checkbook control LLC is we set up the LLC um, in-house, and then once the LLC is set up and approved by the state, you can then go to the bank of your choosing, whether you choose Chase, Wells Fargo, or a local community uh, credit union you can open up your uh, just a simple business checking account because the LLC will have an EIN number and all documents necessary for opening one of those up. And you can open up that uh, checking account at the bank of your choosing. The only thing that will require after that is the wire instructions in order to send the funds from the IRA to your new bank account. Okay, I have an existing self-directed IRA, and I would like to roll a simple IRA dollars into it. Can I do that? The existing self-directed IRA originated with 401k dollars. So I sadly have to answer that question with a question, and my question is, what kind of self-directed IRA is it? Is it a traditional? Is it a Roth? 
Is it a simple, is it a SEP? It's traditional? So yes, you mm -hmm. can, you, give me one second to just check something. Yes, you can uh, roll funds over from sim a simple IRA into a traditional IRA. Okay, great. Uh, please confirm the maximum personal contribution after tax money that my wife and I can make this calendar year into a self-directed IRA. We are both 54 years old. I'm sorry, Brenda, can you repeat that question one more time? Yes, what's the contribution limits that this man and his wife can make uh, into a self-directed IRA? They're 54. They're 54, okay. So then their limit would be, they would have uh, $6,500, oh, 54. It would be $5,500. Thank you. There's also a contribution limits chart on our website mm -hmm. uh, that will also cover all the different account types and their contribution limits. But for a traditional or a Roth IRA, that would be the maximum personal contribution that you can make. But if it's um, another type of a self-directed IRA, you can actually contribute a lot more. So it just depends on your account type. So I just want to continue on um, with my answer from that. Uh, I didn't get an opportunity to finish. So you, your max contribution is $5,500. And then at age 50 or older, you can also contribute an additional $1,000 called catch-up funds. So your total contributions at the age of 54 is 6,500 into each of your IRAs. I just wanted to make that clear because I know it was a husband and wife. All right, wonderful. Okay, that looks like that's all of the questions for today. If anyone has any additional questions, you can email David to ask him any IRA related questions and any 1031 exchange related questions, you can email Mike Reinhardt. Uh, I will be emailing everybody the recording and the slide deck. Um, if anyone has any questions aside from that, you can also ask myself on that email that I send. Um, but otherwise, thank you all for attending. Thank you, David, and thank you, Mike. Great job. Um, and I hope everybody has a uh, great holiday season. Thank you.